Welcome, I'm Rogers Anderson. As we travel around Williamson County today, we have a, I think, a very special guest, Steve Bland. Steve, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Happy to be here. Steve is the, um, I think, is the executive uh, directorship. He's MTA, uh, Metro <laughs> Transit Authority, the RTA, Regional Transportation Authority. So. And there's probably a whole bunch of <laughs> other things. He comes with a wealth of knowledge and experience. And we have the opportunity to just kind of talk a little bit about transit and issues as we face here in Williamson County. Um, I think most of us know that the Middle Tennessee area is one of the fastest growing areas in the right. entire nation. Davidson County is uh, scheduled to grow uh, some unbelievable number, and here Williamson County is the fastest growing mm -hmm. county in the mm -hmm. state. Exactly. So how do we get these people, how do we get people back and forth? That's if you put a central theme over it, but let's kind of drop back a little bit, talk about you and why you're here, and this program that uh, that's kind of going over the Middle Tennessee area uh, in motion and of course we need to change it to W Williamson motion exactly. but talk to us a little bit about some of these transit and issues that we're facing over sure. the next 25 and 30 and 50 years sure. well first of all mayor anderson thank you for having me on the program it's a great opportunity to talk about these issues in williamson county in particular in middle tennessee in general i've been in mass transit now for about 30 years of my career you know in a number of markets and one of the things that's exciting about being in middle tennessee is it really is a rapidly changing environment. Um, we've had sort of the traditional, what I'll call small bus system, you know, in Nashville. More recently, we've had the commuter services of the Regional Transportation Authority that you serve on the board for. And with the growth, particularly the projected growth uh, in Middle Tennessee, people are saying, well, what are our options for being able to move around the community? Folks here uh, remember it being Williamson County, Nashville being kind of the 15 minute community. Now it's maybe the 20 minute and we're projected out to be 30 or more. So what we're kind of articulating is how do we put the right mix of improvements, roadway improvements, signal improvements, highway expansion, and mass transit together in an effective combination so middle Tennesseans can continue to enjoy a quality of life and we can continue to be one of the fastest growing regions in the country. You know, Mayor Moore, Dr. Ken Moore, the mayor of Franklin, who's a good friend, and we probably should have had him on the show here to talk about it too, he often has made the comment uh, in his speaking engagements and things, there's about as many people going to Davidson County yeah. to work, or in reverse, there's about as many people coming over from Nashville and Murfreesboro and Columbia right. in to work in the Cool Springs, Franklin, Brentwood area. Absolutely. And what's you, you talked about the really dynamic growth, and people think about population and that growth. What's really phenomenal in Williamson County is the projected job growth. It's a huge number of jobs now projected to grow even more. And you hit the nail on the head. Whenever I'm commuting back and forth between, say, Franklin and Nashville, right around rush hour, if you didn't know which direction you were headed, you couldn't tell by traffic flow because it is super heavy in both directions. And now if we see you know, really the dynamic growth of the Cool Springs area in particular, but also in the city of Franklin and some of the other commercial developments that are just on the books, there really is a need for us to provide more options for how workforce gets there. And one of the things I talked to a group uh, this afternoon in Williamson County about was the fact that as we do a number of public meetings around the region, we're hearing as much from people in Nashville about needing more options to get to the Cool Springs, Franklin, Williamson County area as we are hearing from Williamson County people saying we need better options on how to get into Nashville. Let's talk about some of the bus services and services we offer. Now we're not going to exclude the rail, that just happens to be a very, very costly mm -hmm. uh, way to get people from point A to, to point B and long after you and I are gone, uh, there may be a solution. That doesn't mean we're not working on it. But that is a very, very costly right. solution. And takes a long time. And takes a long time. And the other one is, and this is more in Commissioner John Schroer's area, who's the Commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Transportation. Um, there's no questions. We need more lanes. We need more utilization of, uh, of roads. Again, that is a costly figure. But that's not going to solve our total problem. Mm -hmm. That's not going to fix all of our 
uh, ills to be able to get around uh, and roads uh, oftentimes about the time you finish them as we've seen on I-65 south and north about the time you get them finished it offers relief it offers some solutions but it also offers as we're growing we never can get ahead right. of it so it's going to be a combination a mix of everything yeah one of the things I've heard Commissioner Schroer say, and, and Williamson County certainly will serve with Commissioner Schroer, he knows the issues here intimately, but he talks about the tools we have in the toolbox, and we really as a region have to make use of all of them. So as you've alluded to, roadway improvements have to be a big part, you know, whether that's functional improvements, things like traffic signals, adaptive signaling, or roadway expansions, um, spot intersection improvements, expansion of the interstate corridors, without a doubt, with a million more people projected to come to our region, those options have to be on the table. But you said it you know, very clearly that if you add a lane to say I-65 right now, literally within five years of it being open, you wouldn't notice the improvement because the growth is that dynamic. So a big part of the planning, and, and we're working cooperatively, the RTA, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the Caucus of Mayors that you're very active in, T dot with how do we put all of these pieces together in a way that makes sense, in a way that fits, in a way that preserves quality of life while accommodating growth, and frankly, how do we get the biggest bang for the buck? So In Motion is a program that's a good year old. Uh, it uh, had its start, had its uh, uh, genesis out of the Nashville area. Uh, actually, about the time you came on board, which is a credit to you, a feather in your hat if that's it. I don't know that you can ever get all the solutions <laughs> in it, but uh, tell us a little bit about sure. N, which stands for Nashville Motion, and uh, what you're hearing out there, and what will that offer as you gather this data and information? Sure. Well, I don't think it's any secret to anyone who's followed uh, mobility or mass transit debate in the Nashville metropolitan region that in motion was sort of born out of the ashes of the AMP project. People may remember the AMP project in Nashville as a bus rapid transit project, very controversial. Um, ultimately, when Mayor Dean was mayor, he chose not to pursue that project. Coming out of that, one of the criticisms we heard was, you know, there just wasn't enough upfront public engagement. So people who came out very opposed to the project said, look, if we had been involved earlier, to help identify solutions, we probably would have been more supportive. So Enmotion was really created to make up for that, um, that, that lack of early public engagement. The other criticism we heard was, well, gee, we, we get the project. The AMP was designed to be high-end, what's called bus rapid transit, essentially along the West End corridor in Nashville, from downtown Nashville out to the university area, Vanderbilt University area. One of the other criticisms we heard is, well, we don't see how that fits into an overall system. You know, what impact does that have on Williamson County? What impact does it have on Sumner County, even the various neighborhoods of Nashville? So the overriding goal of End Motion was to do active public engagement. To date, we've engaged uh, about 15,000 people, really in all 10 counties of the RTA service area, significant participation in Williamson County. And what people are telling us is pretty consistent. In Williamson County, um, extremely consistent. By and large, it is, if you can get me from point A to point B with respect to mass transit, if you can get me from point A to point B faster than I can get there in my car, I will use it. Um, initially, we heard a lot of folks say, well, you know, we're from Nashville, we're from Middle Tennessee, we don't use mass transit, we're not like New York or Chicago. We're certainly not like New York or Chicago, but we are consumers. And people say, if it's affordable, if it gets me fast, if it gets me there fast, if it's convenient, I will use it because it is a better option. And that's a lot of what we're tying our, what we call our design principles around is where are those opportunities where we can make it better uh, than the alternative that they have. So Steve, we have a couple of bus routes we run in Williamson County, they start around the Murray County line, Murray County line down at mm -hmm. Spring Hill and the Thompson Station area. Comes up, drops off at Highway 96. Uh, it, thank goodness Williamson Medical Center allowed us to mm -hmm. have some land over there. You can park your vehicle, you can catch the bus and go on into Nashville. Uh, th there's two routes, the 91X right. and the 95X. Uh, we need more participation, clearly, mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we need more participation, not just from the citizens, but but uh, as people are hearing about these and we're educating them that if you've got a job that's specific in nature that you can get to 
you need to be at work around 8 and you want to come home by about 4.30, this is perfect. Mm -hmm. The backside of that is it's not for everyone. Right. And that seems to be the big hurdle that oftentimes we hear, well, I really, I don't start work till 9 and I don't get off here. I need to come home at a different time. Granted, but what in motion in this whole survey is working to, towards is more flexibility yep. in our overall plan. But today, we still have admirable, better-than-average yep. ridership on those two routes. Yes. No, that's exactly right. And what we find is with the riders of the 91X and the 95X, the two routes that you mentioned in Williamson County, by and large, when we survey customers, the things that they ride that, that vehicle for, as you say, number one, has to fit my schedule. If it doesn't fit my schedule, it's kind of a non-starter. Um, number two is a cost advantage. And we're very fortunate. You, know, you mentioned Williamson Medical Center. We have a lot of business partnerships, not just to provide the park and ride facilities, a number of our area Kroger's provide park and ride, but we also have a number of regional employers who underwrite the cost of fares. Mm -hmm. So for instance, Vanderbilt University underwrites the cost of their employee fares to and from work. So if you're a Vanderbilt employee, let's say living in Spring Hill or living in Thompson Station, you get on that bus, you're not paying for parking in Midtown Nashville, you're not paying to ride the bus, so you have that cost advantage. And even though you're in the same traffic on I-65 that everybody in their car is in, um, you can text without repercussion. You know, you can do your email, you can read your book, you, you know, you can do all of the things that as drivers we at least shouldn't be doing, uh, even if some of us are doing them. And that tends to be, you know, the comfort and convenience factor for those individuals. But what's really lacking to this point, you hit on a couple of these points, is for people who need to work later or might have to adjust a schedule that there aren't enough trips to attract as many as we would like. And again, I'll come back to um, a comment we've heard routinely from folks in Spring Hill or in Franklin or in Brentwood is, look, if I'm in the same traffic that I can be in in my car, you know, what's the compelling reason for me to use it? We've kind of turned the triangle um, in a prior life long before I was mayor. Uh, you, you always set the issues at hand you, before you find the solution, and I don't want to get to the solution. Uh, I'm sure you do a lot quicker <laughs> than I do, but, but we have to really look out into the, the, the year 2040, because if you started on it today, as I've heard uh, the governor of the state talk about roads, if you started today, it's six years before they're driving on yeah. it. Uh, by the time you do the land acquisition and all of the engineering studies that require, then there's this thing laying the pavement down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all the environmental issues, that if you built a road today, it's six years. I'm sure to some degree there's a common denominator that runs parallel along with transit issues. What you're doing now is laying that base, right. getting it prepared for looking out into the year 2040. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and a lot of the things in the end motion process we're looking at that you would call the high dollar, or the high visibility projects, you know, whether that's high end bus rapid transit or rail alternatives, you're really looking at very long term types of projects. But in the meantime, out over the next one, three, five, ten years, what groundwork can we lay so that if the region decides to go after those types of investments, they're well utilized? And there are a number of those that we're looking very heavily at. Technology is huge right now. I mean, most folks are using some form of smartphone technology. So the ability to do trip planning, the ability to have real-time access to information about where your bus is, when it's going to get to you, is it running late, why is it running late, and when's it going to get to me, what are my alternatives? Even mobile fare payment, you know, not having to worry about, well, do I carry exact change? Do I get a pass from my employer? Being able to do all that with your phone. And ultimately, to expand that market, we're in a partnership now with Vanderbilt University on what they're calling their T-Hub application, which will essentially be a consolidated travel app for Middle Tennessee. So if you live in Nolensville and you're interested in going to a Predators game, you know, what are my options? What options are available to me? Well, if I drive, 
here's what the traffic's going to be, and here much, here's how much it's going to cost me to park, and here's where that parking might be available. But what if I want to take transit? You know, what solutions are there? Where might the parking ride be? What does that schedule look like? How close will it get me to the arena? If I wanted to use taxi or an Uber or one of those other types of applications, you know, what's out there for me? So one of the core things we've heard from consumers is it's just a complex navigating Middle Tennessee anymore. It's a complex issue used to be this is the road I travel and this is how I get there now well that road's backed up with traffic so I'll take the backup route transit becomes complicated to figure out so it's how do we use that technology to make the user experience very simple very transparent um, and really they can define it around their needs you know, do I want to try to save money am I trying to save time what do I need to accomplish in my trip so when you look out into your crystal ball and and you're the expert in the transit issues for folks in the South for many, many years, and I'm going to say for the last 40 to 50 years, that one of the key components that all of us wanted to have was have a home and own an automobile. Now, those came at different points in our lives. Mm -hmm. May come in your 20s. Most of us as boys, young men, uh, couldn't wait to buy that first automobile, lift the hood, and work under it. Unfortunately, we can't do that today as a general yeah. rule. Later on in life, you you went to the bank, um, you, you pulled a mortgage, you were able to purchase a home. And there's some of us that have grown up that ownership of the car and the ability to drive wherever I want is almost a right. Mm -hmm. We know there are uh, consequences of having those rights. One is traffic, bumper mm -hmm. to bumper, uh, automobile claims, uh, higher insurance costs, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you kind of bridge that gap that would allow an independent person making a good living, getting back and forth is, uh, to, to his or her job, and how do we do that and still send that message you do have that freedom, mm -hmm. such as what's occurring in Dallas, what's occurring in, in Denver. There are many, many places that have a very successful right. uh, um, um, bus transit system that you don't have to worry about fighting your way on and fighting your way right. off. Well, I think uh, one of the things is by promoting the message, you know, it's okay if you drive. Most of us are going to drive sure. for most of our trips. Um, but it's responding to that individual market. What are those situations where a mass transit solution may work better? Uh, I did a presentation. It was actually with the Williamson County Realtors Group some months ago and gave the presentation. At the end of the presentation, one of the realtors raised their hand and said, look, I'm in and out of my car all day. I'm showing houses, I'm looking at properties, I'm meeting with mortgage bankers. I will never in a million years use mass transit in my job. But if I want to go to a Predators game on a Saturday night and I don't want to have to worry about whether I have that second or third beer or not, and I had an option that were simple, quick, convenient, safe, I would absolutely use it. And in the cities you're describing, Mary Anderson, that's what people are finding. You know, driving in those cities that have been, quote, successful with mass transit, Denver, Dallas, Seattle, driving is still the dominant form. Most people still drive for most trips. But take a few of those key congested work corridors, take a few of those key congested events, you know, a hockey game, a football game, um, college sports, what have you, and make it a better choice and all of a sudden the range of options, options uh, really fans out. And I think that's what, if we've heard anything more from people in Middle Tennessee than, than anything, it's we want to feel like we have choice. We want to be able to pick the best choice for ourselves and our families for any given trip. We don't necessarily want to be bound to one. I don't want to be forced to ride a bus. On the other hand, gee, are there better options than just driving by myself, taking twice as long as it did 10 years ago? So how long is this going to take us, Steve, to find the solutions to some of these? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think some can happen very quickly. Others, uh, one, uh, actually I was speaking to a school superintendent. He said, you know, your job is a lot like mine. It never ends. You know, you don't fix education. You just keep working on it. And I think the same is true with transportation and mobility. Um, to, for people in Middle Tennessee to take heart, I think a lot of the technology and service innovations can happen relatively quickly, relatively affordably. You know, in the next three to five years, we can have integrated smartphone apps that tie together things like T-dot traffic data with transit information so that someone who's 
um, going into Nashville for an event from Spring Hill can say, okay, here are my options. You know, here's how I can save time or here's how I can save money. Um, you mentioned some of the issues with park and ride. One of the biggest challenges and frankly one of the biggest benefits we could have to generating more ridership on routes like the 91 and the 95X are what I'll call higher. We appreciate the businesses who give us park and ride space. But when we can put a purpose-built facility closer to the interstate, you know, that's essentially right between your home and your, and your workplace, then all of a sudden it becomes an attraction. And in the locations in Middle Tennessee where we have those, we've seen even greater success with commuter services. So even though in this process things like light rail or commuter rail, the big dollar, big ticket, long-term projects have gotten a lot of attention, I think it's actually some of the lower hanging fruit that are really exciting about uh, you know getting us on you know, getting us on our wheels. So because I sit on several other boards, I know that <clears throat> Montgomery County, Clarksville, uh, Springfield, uh, Robertson County, um, Gallatin, Sumner County, all of these surrounding counties um, are having probably a little higher degree of success than what we're having here in Williamson County, which kind of does hurt a little bit that the, that the other county mayor, I won't tell them you said I, that. I know that. <laughs> and, the, and the county executives. And, but I look at Rutherford County and, and Murfreesboro area. Uh, I do not travel I-24 in the morning, and I can't imagine traveling yeah. that quarter in the morning. But those bus routes are very, very popular. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we see a couple things. First of all, one of the things that's really noteworthy, and it kind of comes back to some people would say it comes back to the issue of rail, but I would also say it comes back to the consumer behavior piece. So we have the one rail line in Middle Tennessee, the Music City Star that runs between Nashville and Lebanon in Wilson County with stops six stations in Mount Juliet, Lebanon in, uh, in Nashville. And if you were to adjust, if you were to compare Wilson County, Williamson County, Rutherford County, and you were to adjust, Rutherford and Williamson are much larger counties, the daily traffic volumes in I-65 and I-24 I are higher than I-40. When you adjust all of that on a, on a normalized basis, we're getting more than twice as much ridership on the Music City Star as we are on the commuter bus routes. When you survey Star riders, they have a very close affinity with that service. Part of it is everybody loves a train, but frankly the other part is it is a shorter trip. They're not stuck in traffic. Um, and frankly, when something happens on I-40, which is at least once or twice a week, and traffic is delayed even more, they almost get a little chuckle out of it. Uh, and I'm being charitable. I think they do get a little chuckle out of it, knowing that a lot of their neighbors are kind of stuck in that. So that, that's one piece that gets back to it, is uh, making sure you have a competitive product. It was interesting. I was sitting here, and my mind was kind of going back to the early days of the Music City Star and how difficult that was in getting that up. I was around during those times, and how we were just trying to find dollars and cents to be able to pull this off. And, and I owe a lot of that to the governor at that time, Bredesen, Governor Bredesen, that, that stepped in and said, we've got to make this work. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't just happen overnight. Right. It took a process to financially make this work in the cities and the county. And even in spite of that, not all of the cities and counties see the benefit. It's kind of amazing to me. They all want the product. They just don't want to pay for it. Yeah, exactly. And we see that all over um, all over our network. But we've got to find a solution yeah. to this, Steve. Yeah, no, we absolutely have to. And I, and I think you just hit on a key to it with the star success and the leadership of Governor Bredesen. And one of the reasons, one of the things that gives me optimism is the leadership of the regional mayors here. Everybody acknowledges there is an issue. We can argue about, well, whose county should get what first, or how should we pay for it? But everybody acknowledges it's an issue that we absolutely have to solve. There's no option, um, because it really will be a cornerstone to whether we can continue to develop economically and retain a quality of life. And we can have those little arguments about how to pay, who should pay, but at the end of the day, we do have to fix it. And, and, and you're right, we do have to fix it. We do have to find those major routes because as much as Williamson County is growing along with um, uh, Mayor Hutto's area up in Wilson County or Ernest Burgess area over in the Rutherford County, we as an individual community cannot carry the water from the well totally on ourselves. Correct. It's just an impossible task uh, to do that. Now, once 
that route and that goes to Nashville or goes to Murfreesboro, et cetera, goes around, then maybe the, at the local level through groups like Debbie Henry's group of getting people from uh, the Cool Springs area back over to Franklin area and those tourist bases, that can be enhanced, that can be improved. Yeah. But unless you've got that transportation mode going, um, going from here to the Nashville area, which is the center of our business hub, now, we, now, Cool Springs is a mighty powerful business, of, yeah. but it's not like the Davidson County market. And the Davidson County market has all the other extras in the evening hours that so many of the places in Williams County just do yeah. not have. Yeah. Well, I think the key to a healthy region is recognizing that if you live in Williamson County, I can easily take advantage of what Nashville has to offer. If I live in Nashville, I can take advantage of what Williamson County has to offer and that those aren't impossible trips. When you look at some of the largest urban areas, you know, the, the problem is, I heard a story about in the New York area, people who are on those online dating services, mm -hmm. they will rule out somebody because they live too far on the other side of the region, uh, becomes an impossible to get together <coughs> before they would ever do it based on, you know, what they do for a living or what their appearance is or what have you. So it's how do we strike that balance and, and make it, how does each county and each community retain its own individuality, what makes it special, but makes it part of that, that larger region. And speaking of that, we've got about two minutes left, and I'm sure I have forgotten something that you want to mention. One, either a phone number or a website that people can contact, get online, read a little bit more about this, study it, and make your voice known. Absolutely. Would absolutely <coughs> encourage everyone to go to the website N, N as in national, motion2016.org, all the information that you could ever hope for, including maps, <laughs> um, more information than you will <laughs> ever read say. unless you have uh, too much time on your hands. And most important, we hope people will weigh in. We're doing a survey right now, but even more than just the individual check the box survey answers is give us your comments. You know, what's important to the residents of Williamson County? What should the priorities be? You know, what are the things that they want us to know about in terms of putting forth recommendations for a future system? And I might uh, offer as a suggestion also, in the, uh, as a comment, those people here in Williamson County that are watching this show, that it, the meetings that are occurring throughout our community, please go to one of them. Mm -hmm. Let your voice be known. That's so important because we're not going to find these solutions overnight, but you may just come in with an idea that we haven't thought about yeah. or put something else on there that sparks that interest in someone else. Yep. Yeah, and to highlight that point, we put three scenarios out for comment. I'd be very surprised if we end up recommending one of the three. I think it's going to be one of the three with about 12 different variations that are frankly coming out of those comments. Steve Bland's got a job to do over the next few years. He's the right man. I feel very confident with his leadership, all of us will find solutions. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Again, this is Rogers Anderson. And uh, feel free to weigh in on this issue. Call us, 615-790-5700 is the office number. Look forward to seeing you at the next appropriate time. Have a good day. Library has a Star Wars Club. Have you seen The Force Awakens? Come and chat about it and the other movies in the series. Bonus, you can dress up as your favorite Star Wars character, play Star Wars games, and chat all about things Star Wars. Led by our teen Star Wars expert.